Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you for joining us and taking the time to share this wonderful story um, that Jim is about to share with us. His, uh, every time I talk to him, I feel re-inspired and re-centered, mainly centered. That's what I, I that I, that's the, the feeling I get. Um, so uh, we want you to visit our website and uh, follow us on social media, Instagram and Twitter because and Facebook because we have these sessions every second Saturday of every month. Um, Jim is, we're, we're happy to welcome his, him as our first speaker. Um, after the presentation, I'll stay online to answer any questions you might have about the nursery school program so we can see, keep that separate. But for now, please, please use the chat option that's at the bottom of your screen to pose questions for Jim from you or your children. And we'll answer these with him toward the end of the presentation. I want to welcome Jim. Jim, welcome. Thank you so much. He's very busy right now. Um, and I just want to, I have to read this to you because this is how I met Jim Embry, was at the 2020 Nature-Based Early Learning Conference recently. And I was going through the bios of the presenters and this one reads like poetry, so I just really want to read it to you. Um, Jim Embry considers himself stardust congealed in human form that represents billions of, Earth, of years of Earth's evolution. As an evolutionary being, his purpose is to contribute to, the to a paradigm shift towards sacred Earth consciousness and refers to himself as the sacred Earth activist. As an activist, Jim part has participated in most of the major social justice movements of his era and now believes that the sustainability movement encompasses all other movements. And this is a bit of what we heard if you joined us in the beginning, he was talking towards this. Um, as the founder and director of Sustainable Communities Network, Jim seeks to contribute to the theory and practice of sustainable living. As a scuba diver and photographer, Jim has traveled widely to capture the beauty of the land and oceans. He has exhibited his exhibited his photos in local hospitals, galleries, and local magazines. Working now on two books, Jim has contributed articles and photographs to the Sustainable World Source Book, link, oh, we have the, we can find the link to include it, sure. an encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky, Kentucky African American Encyclopedia, Latino Studies, Biodynamics Journal, African American Heritage Guide, and other publications. Uh, Jim believes that we need some big ideas that connect humans in a sacred relationship with the earth, which will require us to think not just out of the box, but out of the barn. And this is the, what I want to tell you is that, yes, these are big ideas, but what I get when I uh, talked with him are close ideas. They're heartfelt. Um, so I, I, tell this story uh, often is that after I talked to him on the phone about sharing with our friends and families here, I, uh, he inspired me to walk outside of the school. I was at the school at the time and I stood within all the traffic noise of our city life, our city, uh, city lot and, um, and took a deep breath and it centered me. It reminded me of what my work should be. And I hope that after this presentation, you will do it. So thank you for joining us today. I will hand this over to our friend, Jim Embry. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you all, thank you all, thank you all. Yes, Jim Embry here. I live in Richmond, Kentucky, which is a small city in central Kentucky that sits at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And we're in the watershed of the Kentucky River. Uh, I live on a farm that goes back in our family to around the 1890s or so, uh, but it's part of the um, land area that was inhabited, say, ancestrally by the indigenous people that we know now as the, oh, the Cherokee, uh, the Shawnee, and the uh, Chickasaw people. It's always good for us to um, kind of think about that there were people before we recent immigrants came to Turtle Island or our United States 500 years ago, uh, folks lived here, some say 10,000 years, 20,000 years, or 30,000 years. So um, our effort to, to make the USA a sense of home, we can learn a lot from indigenous people. So again, I'm blessed to be here and I thank you all for 
taking your Saturday morning <laughs> to join in. I'm gonna um, try to uh, keep my remarks and some of the images to about 30 minutes to allow us uh, some time for some conversation. And I, I'm looking at all the, all the uh, kids here. Thank you kiddos for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, we love you all much. And uh, I, I wish I was there able to give you a first fist bump or an elbow bump, but I'm gonna say hi now here virtually. Um, I want to say one thing that um, you know we're 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 facing uh, in this century uh, all kinds of issues and problems and pandemics from the COVID-19 pandemic from this question of of racial and gender justice pandemic climate change uh, ecology kinds of uh, problems and disasters and pandemics as well as extreme in inequality uh, economically. These are all pandemics that we're all asked to kind of step forward and contribute to. And um, I know last century, the mantra was that everybody, every adult, every child needed to be computer literate. Okay, fine. And many of us are, and some of us are too addicted to computers. Well, my mantra has been this century but especially with the challenges around ecology, the Earth's uh, systems, climate change, that everyone, every adult, <laughs> every middle-aged person, and every child, like I see here, needs to be eco-literate or Earth-literate. That's the challenge. But we're not seeing people who are proclaiming that we're still uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, we're, we're focused around what's called STEM, all these, you know, engineering and technology kinds of, um, uh, of proclamations and kids, everyone should be in STEM classes. I'm nothing wrong with STEM classes. However, to me, the greatest challenge isn't about how well we can use computers and technology, but how well we can connect what we call the earth and the earth systems. And in my view, the very best place to teach eco-literacy, our earth-centric thinking, is in a garden. Uh, I've worked over the years with, with, with young kids that could barely walk, you know, uh, crawling around, uh, you know, one, one and a half years old, uh, working in the garden. Uh, in the garden, you learn how to work together. Those are important skills that we need now uh, as adults. How do we collaborate? How do we network? How do we work together? You learn in the garden about systems thinking. Uh, one of our problems is that we're still, you know, we're still um, being conditioned by this Newtonian view of the world, things being separate, dichotomized. And Newtonian thinking has also brought us to this point that somewhere over there is the environment, okay? Somewhere outside, somewhere way over there in the mountains or at the ocean, that's where the environment is. As opposed to, opposed to us saying that humans reside right in the midst of the environment. <laughs> it's always around us, not just over there. But it, the point is, but in the garden, it's where we can learn this idea of systems thinking and this sense of closeness to the environment. And the garden can be, uh, it can be a garden inside the school building. It can be a garden that is around the school building. The garden can be where you're planting edible things, medicinal herbs, trees. The garden is also composed of all these other non-human uh, family members, okay? The, the insects, the animals, uh, the worms, the fungi, and so forth. The garden can also be, of course, in the wooded and the forest areas. Is, of course, it's an important part of the idea of where the garden is. The garden can be in the mountains. It can be along the ocean, along the streams. And if we borrow from certain kinds of religious texts, uh, we, we have this notion of the Garden of Eden, okay, which in my view is the earth. And wherever we are on, on the earth is a sacred place. So the garden is all those different kind of locations. 
and it's important that our young people be allowed and, 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 and be led to be involved in the garden. <clears throat> Again, I mentioned earlier, uh, as a 10 year old, I began uh, my, my tenure as a civil rights uh, activist within CORE, a direct action civil rights organization. I've been involved in pretty much all the social movements for the last 60 years. Uh, and I won't dwell on that too much, but I want to reaffirm that in my view, this, this movement toward sustainable communities encompasses all the other movements. We can't be sustainable if we're still oppressing, doing violence towards harassing women. We can't be sustainable if young people aren't given a chance through their uh, curriculum, through their schooling, to be outside, connect, touch worms, touch, touch the soil, grow things, climb trees, fall in the water, and things of that nature. So sustainability encompasses all the various other social movements. Um, I uh, came back from Detroit from a five years in Detroit, heading up a, a leadership center. And I returned to uh, Lexington and I found it was called Sustainable Communities Network. And we are a network of people who operate at a local level, uh, at a statewide level. Uh, we also operate internationally. And maybe one day, young kids will operate intergalactically. That's what we're hoping for. <laughs> anyway. Uh, as was mentioned, I had the um, uh, like really divine pleasure to be invited by some other friends of mine to participate in the publication of this book, Sustainable World Source Book, published about 10 years ago. Uh, I wrote various chapters in there uh, collaboratively and also had in there various uh, photographs. Um, I became involved uh, about two, three years ago with what's called the North American Association for Environmental Education. And um, uh, that's been a, a wonderful experience. And I was like, uh, what to call a one of the uh, EE360 fellows, 30 some odd people from all around the USA. But we also had some of our fellows who were from India, Nepal, uh, Australia, like a global kind of a, of a fellowship of people that we've been interacting with. Uh, back up one minute. So last year, I had, the, you know, again, the, the divine blessing of helping to uh, co-host this conference here in Lexington. We had a wonderful time. And I got a chance then to uh, design these, um, these outings, uh, whether they were canoe rides on the uh, Kentucky River, or whether they were going to Berea College and, and walking in the pinnacles or in the mountains and, and watching draft horses drag logs out of the forest or uh, working uh, in an art garden and planting trees. So I was just had a, had a great time helping co-host that conference. Uh, and then um, back early this summer, as was mentioned, I gave a presentation uh, to the uh, Nature-Based Early Learning Conference uh, one of my favorite topics, which is George Washington Carver and his relevance uh, today with nature study. I'm going to touch on that uh, a bit as we go through uh, today's presentation. Um, but so part of what helps me every day remain hopeful, remain determined, remain diligent, vigilant, is this notion of this sense of, of, of not only our own human species evolution, but the evolution of the earth. As we know from geologists and other kinds of um, scholars, you know, we say the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. She's been around for a long time. <laughs> and that uh, some billions of years ago, you know, kind of like a big bang or all this stardust kind of blew out. And uh, from that stardust, everything else has evolved. What if we taught our kids that yes, we're all divine lights because physically we're all stardust condensed in this human form, okay? And, uh, and that we have a divine purpose. We have a purpose to contribute to this continuing evolution of the earth as a planet, but also humans as a species. So you young people who are listening in, part of your role, part of your work, 
is to find ways within your daily life to contribute to this evolution as a species. Do we want to become a species that continues to, to, to impact negatively different species? Or do we want to be a species that recognizes that we're all from the same source? And the idea of stardust and quantum science says we're all from the same source. We're all interconnected. We're all family. Okay? So we're family with all the people, whether it is the human people, whether it's the plant people, the animal people, the rock people, the water people, the air people, the fire people, we're all connected. These are, these are all members of our family. Again, we have, uh, we have one earth. And uh, so the idea of, of, of young people getting outside uh, is important because being outside in direct contact with the air, the water, the soil, the insects, uh, the animals. This morning before coming over here, I'm at the library now, I have in front of my front porch uh, a beautiful pond uh, that has water lilies and other kinds of water plants. It's got fish, uh, koi and goldfish and, and, and black moors and some um, uh, other kinds of minnows. It's got frogs and I come out every morning and I speak to my frogs and fish and they come up, they're thinking it's, 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 it's eating time, it's breakfast time. <laughs> and I'll talk to the plants and the trees around me. So they're all saying hello, okay? The frogs are saying hello, the fish are as well. Um, but we live on a landmass that we now call the United States, North America. Uh, people who are indigenous refer to it as Turtle Island. So part of our work, I would submit, that wherever we're providing for young people uh, this experience of education is to also ground them in this indigenous wisdom of wherever you're located. If you're in Maryland, if you're in the Northeast part of the United States, up in that area, you know, the young people ought to have a sense of these, this culture, this wisdom that preceded us, however we came here, that preceded us, is an important part of this outdoor classroom because the trouble we're in now wouldn't be so bad in terms of ecology if we had been listening to the indigenous people. Their culture and their life was embedded in nature study, being outside, connections with all the other members of their family uh, that they were uh, attuned with. So it's important for us now as we're trying to find some, some direction to also link up this, uh, this ancient kind of ancient and current wisdom. Again, they regarded North America as Turtle Island. Uh, when I've done work again with gardens, with kids, one of the things that we do, we do uh, straw bale construction and we construct turtles from straw bale. I can send you all some images of that. And that's a way again of, of, of having a fun project to do, a project that's having kids using their hands, but it's also a way to help in an artistic and fun way to connect us with that indigenous wisdom and what Turtle Island signifies. So here's just some images that, that are important part of this uh, kind of like wisdom and culture. Uh, in, in Montana, they, a, a state law was passed some eight years ago that requires every citizen in Montana, uh, I'm sorry, every student in Montana to learn about a Native American culture and wisdom. Every state ought to have that, okay? It's a great curriculum designed, of course, by people there who were part of the indigenous nations there in Montana. Every state should have it, every school should have it. You all at Tacoma Park ought to have some type of, of, of curriculum that's, that's developed with the aid of uh, folks in that area who are indigenous, where you have a sense of, 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 of curriculum, you know, guidelines for how to teach about the indigenous cultures in your region. Um, so again, I'm a believer uh, and, and, and I'm always trying to link up with young people. Uh, what I do now has been based upon my years of activism where I had other people who were elders that connected me with what they were doing. 
Uh, and uh, so I'm always trying to, uh, like today, and link up, design programs, interact with young people. And for me, in outside, it doesn't matter how old you are, okay? I tell uh, people in the family, told my own kids, you can begin <laughs> with young people, this kind of education at conception, because quantum thinking says the smallest fractal of, of life is a string vibration. Everything is vibrating, okay? Everything is vibrating. So upon conception, you know, your emotions, your feelings, what you're saying, what you're singing uh, to your children is vibrating with that baby who is, who is in there turning and tussling and whatever. And we think they're not feeling anything, not learning anything, but they are. So again, from in, in, in my work, I work with folks from, from every age. Um, we have here, uh, you'll see in here some of my, some of my photographs, uh, a garden uh, here in Lexington, uh, again, that was a kind of like a pretty diverse uh, garden, uh, people from different ethnic groups, different ages, uh, whatever. Uh, but again, the idea in the garden, uh, we just love to have young people. This is the image of the young woman here, a uh, young girl here, <laughs> who was picking up a clump of dirt and two or three other images shows her bringing it up to her mouth and taking a bite. And her mom just looked at her and said, well, she's okay. <laughs> because as we know, uh, when we eat plants, when we eat animals, what we're doing, we're eating dirt secondhand or third hand. The plants literally eat the dirt absorb water, absorb air, absorb sunlight, and then they create all this beautiful array of, of fruits and vegetables. And then we eat those, we're eating dirt secondhand. And we eat animals who eat other animals or plants, then we're still eating dirt, that's what we're doing. It's a great movie, if you all maybe uh, uh, haven't shown it to the kids, uh, it's called Dirt the Movie. Uh, I recommend, if you haven't, you probably have, it's a wonderful movie, it's, it's fun, it's animated. Some friends of mine are in there. Uh, uh, it features um, so, some words from Vandana Shiva, who I've known, oh, maybe 12, 15 years, as well as one guy, Matai, from, uh, from Kenya. Um, There's another image of a young woman who is from Yemen. I won't tell you the whole story, but this is a, uh, a, uh, a, a photograph that I call when I'm having it in exhibits, it's called gold dust. That's why I call it, it's called gold dust. And if, if you were here, I would ask you, why is it called gold dust? Well, because if you see on her fingers is this black fertile soil. And this area here is, is across from a school that was an empty lot full of trash and tires and bricks and glass. When we cleaned it up and made it into a school garden and, uh, and we brought in, of course, compost and mulch and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but it symbolizes that this black soil on her hands is more valuable than gold. The black soil is more valuable than gold, is what we teach. Uh, and again, here's another example from my gardens of uh, to young women who discovered this, um, uh, this uh, tomato hornworm. Uh, the covenant with the bracket wasp. Again, in the garden, you can teach about systems. It's, as you all know, I'm sure it's incredible. Okay, <laughs> but 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 these young women was their first time seeing this huge worm. Okay, a huge caterpillar, and then covered with these wasp eggs. So we had a chance then to explain what's going on here uh, with this uh, piece of a tomato plant and the. Uh, and the systems in place. So just great times, great discovery, it's fun. Uh, and of course we recognize, you know, how important role that, that, that worms play within the soil, uh, along with the fungi and other kinds of, there's a whole network in the ground. Um, now, we, uh, I wanna touch on, if I can, before I close out, a bit about George Washington Carver, uh, who uh, I didn't realize until a couple of years ago, we, 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 we've had these historical connections that go back to my, to my great 
great grandfather, uh, who actually was a friend of Carver's, invited him to Richmond to speak around 1919 uh, and so forth. Uh, but I've just discovered that in the last several years. So I've been even more enthralled and excited about talking about Carver. We tend to uh, see him primarily as the peanut wizard, and he gets kind of like, you know, narrowly defined in that kind of a way. Uh, of course, he was uh, an expert, if you will, on, on growing peanuts and creating products out of peanuts, using peanut oil for uh, massage therapy, people who had polio, uh, and so forth. But he was much more than that. He was much, um, he, he, his, his, his reach was really profound. He was one of the few Americans uh, and the first uh, African American to be invited to be a member of the Royal Society of Arts over there in England. Uh, he was friends with a whole host of people. Right here we see uh, Henry Ford. They were dear friends, close confidants, and they conspired together on a number of uh, what we call green uh, industry uh, ideas and concepts. It's a great book uh, called The Green Vision of Henry Ford and George Washington Carver. They kind of uh, examines and, and showcases all of their points of collaboration and their deep love for each other uh, and their respect for each other. Uh, he, he also was good friends with Thomas Edison. Uh, Henry Ford, when he was doing an assessment of, of the great scientist of his time, Edison, as we know, was, was regarded as a great scientist. Henry Ford said <laughs> Carver was even grander as a scientist because his reach was more widespread in a whole variety of ways. Also because Carver, as you know, young kids, uh, was enslaved. Uh, his mother and children were, were, were captured and sold in the further south. So he came from very humble beginnings, became uh, during his lifetime one of the world's greatest scientists. Uh, he was also friends with a whole slew of presidents like Roosevelt here. Uh, he was also friends with Mahatma Gandhi and he aided uh, Gandhi in, in, in uh, kind of like, you know, examining a, a plant-based diet. And there were also, as two people, Gandhi was working with the poorest of the poor in India, and Carver was working with the poorest of the poor here in the United States. So they have a lot of things in, in common and, and dear friends and collaborators on, on a number of things. Uh, Carver also was uh, one of the key people who inspired during World War I and World War II victory gardens. Uh, and as you know, every school, every church, every faith institution during those two wars had a garden. So with your work there at Tacoma Park, people think, I'm sure they might ask you, well, why do you want to do a garden? And why do you want to be outside? We forget that during these two world wars, gardens were every, everywhere. It's not a new idea in that sense. Uh, Carver was also one of the leaders, one of the thinkers, one of the doers, one of the organizational um, uh, advocates and leaders of what we tend to call the nature study movement. Uh, he wrote articles, he attended conferences uh, all around the country and was one of the key people during that period of the 1890s up to his death in 1940s. Um, he was quoted uh, in, in, in newspapers, uh, quoted in various books and journals for his uh, 50 years of work around nature study. Uh, he, uh, back in 1897, uh, began to write his first bulletin about the importance of, of, of schools and nature study. Uh, he went on in uh, um, 1898, writing about children's gardens and nature study, 1910, Another publication about nature study and rural schools. A uh, year before he died, <clears throat> he wrote a, a bulletin again about nature's garden uh, and for victory and peace was again one of his writings that was to advocate for and promote the idea of victory gardens during uh, World War II. But he thought by doing this, they would inspire people not just to do gardens during the war, but to do gardens in peace, okay? And we've got amnesia, we've kind of forgotten about 
the importance of young people, ourselves uh, working in gardens. I work in gardens uh, uh, in Kentucky a lot, or what was called therapeutic horticulture. I work with women who are experienced domestic violence, women who've experienced drug and alcohol addiction, uh, people who've been locked up uh, in prisons, uh, people who uh, come back from uh, military with PTSD, uh, and so forth around this idea of therapeutic horticulture and as a way to help people heal from this trauma. So gardens have many different uh, kinds of applications. One of the reasons why Carver, and he says it himself, became such a, 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 a broad spectrum scientist working on many different avenues okay, of life and science and application. One of the reasons why he, he had a firm belief in a Christian faith, but also a premier scientist. So he didn't separate what's called spirituality and science. He combined the two. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, he was a great proponent of nature study. And he would, he would begin his day when he was, uh, at, say, at Tuskegee. He would go out of his, 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 his bedroom. He would go outside into his garden. And again, his garden could be where he's growing flowers, medicinal plants, herbal plants, edible foods, and also into the forest. This picture here on, you see now was the garden when he was growing up, okay? And again, he was enslaved for um, the first, oh, six or eight years of his life. And because he was kind of sickly, then he was allowed not to do uh, really hard physical work. He was allowed to go off by himself <laughs> into the garden, into the woods of how he spent his years growing up, kind of on his own in many ways. So, so when you look at his life now, uh, as he got older, I mentioned he would go out into the garden every morning at Tuskegee and talk to the plants, talk to the animals, talk to the trees, and he would ask the plants to reveal their secrets to him. Then he would come into the laboratory and execute what the plants had told him. When he was asked why he didn't patent all of his discoveries, he said, well, I didn't discover anything. These plants told me their secrets, okay? So this is an image of his life when as a child and an image of his life as he got to be an adult. And this is an image that, 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 that we say within our various uh, schools around the country like yours in Tacoma, that this is where, this is what the child's classroom should be, okay? This is the child's classroom. Ought to be outside in nature, regardless of weather, okay? If it's raining, it's fine. If it's cold, that's fine. Uh, outside, learning about nature, learning about yourself, learning how to work together, and learning how to think in systems. Uh, so Carver went on uh, at Tuskegee, and he, uh, he traveled all around the South. It was called the, Je the Jessup Wagon, wagon encouraging uh, the schools in the, in the South where people like himself, <clears throat> who had been emancipated a few years earlier, to uh, find a way to exercise their freedom and emancipation uh, by creating fertility in areas that had been left in many cases unfertile because uh, back during the South in Alabama, in the South, uh, people were working on growing cotton primarily uh, as a product. <clears throat> so that was his work. Um, I missed another book here, a few books here. Um, if you, um, uh, this is a great book here called Seed Folks because working in the garden, uh, you know, has a, ha has a benefit for an individual, where he or she can gain a sense of, 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 of nature closeness, nature connection. It can be experienced to learn how to uh, work and think in systems. But also, in my view, you're working in the garden ought to help prepare you to be an active citizen, prepare you to be an agent of change in your community. So what you learn, what you're experiencing ought to build within you a sense of purpose, a sense of character, where you can then go out in your community, even at a young age, and begin to affect change. This book called Seed Folks 
shows how a young girl, a young Asian American girl uh, begins to go out in her community and plant a few seeds and she transformed her community. That, in my view, is that higher purpose that Carver exemplified, that higher purpose of what it means around nature study and, and the idea of working then in the garden. Um, I, I saw on you all's website a variety of books uh, about trees. I have some real special old connections with trees myself in a whole variety of ways. Uh, when I go out to, to uh, California, to Muir Woods and the Great Basin Park, and I try to wrap my arms around these big redwood trees. Kids, as you all know, these redwood trees are, are regarded in some ways as the largest living organisms on earth, okay? These big trees, largest living organisms. They're also regarded as the oldest living organisms on the earth. Some of them are two, two and a half thousand years old. What wisdom they have. As we go to them and we ask them uh, their wisdom over these last 2000 years, but we don't teach folks to do that. We're taught that these, that these trees, these plants, you know, <laughs> they're not, you know, there's nothing to learn. You know, they're not human. Uh, we can't learn from them. But again, quantum science says everything is vibrating. Everything is sending out messages. And, and trees have this above ground and below ground network. So it's a great book here uh, to add to your collection. Uh, we, know, we may know about one Gary Matai uh, who connected the idea of the oppression of women uh, in Kenya with this idea of reforestation and the idea of, 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 of uh, of, of a greater freedom of women to farm and to become business people. And it was called the Green Belt Movement. And she uh, organized thousands of women uh, around Kenya to plant millions of trees. And she was able to radically uh, uh, topple a dictator in uh, Kenya called Moy. And she got chosen to um, be a part of the parliament, received a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so her life. It's like Carver's life. In my view, if you center your life around nature, if you make these connections of, of, of the forest and the trees and the gardens and the oceans uh, with your life and your work, you can achieve great things, okay? Um, so, okay, one. Now, last couple of slides. Um, so, when I'm working in the community with gardens, we usually call them art gardens uh, because we try to incorporate all types of art uh, within the garden, as well as there's no better, you know, as a photographer, I may take a picture of a rose or, 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 or a tree, but I always remind people that that photograph of that rose is only one dimensional. You say it's beautiful, and it, it, it is a beautiful photograph, but that photograph can't even come close to the beauty, the grandeur, the complexity of the actual roads. So again, so, uh, so all around us, we have art. It's not just what humans do. Uh, so anyway, but, but we do art gardens, and oftentimes we take um, recycled objects, found objects, and we bring them in, because uh, sometimes if you're in the garden working and you're digging and you're planting and, and whatever, uh, some kids get a little restless. And so art is a way to, to channel kids' energy into something that's fun. So we um, began years ago uh, making these flowers, if you will, made from um, uh, ceiling fans that we find being thrown out, you know, on the streets. We, you know, we, we grab them, put them in my van, and we've done a bunch of these. All around the city and the story here is this young woman here named amanda uh was was, was homeschooled she came with her own little toolbox she and her mom and, and 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 two other sisters and she was so great to work with so she helped us uh paint this um flower and then she mentioned to me, mr ember you like something's missing i said well what do you mean something's missing she says well we got the flower 
but there's no B and there's no pollinator. So she went around this lot, okay, and she found a walnut, she found a water bottle. We're already using some plant, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, containers. And she went around and she found uh, what she thought would be sufficient and she made this bee, okay? <laughs> Took a little drill and <laughs> drilled the walnut, <laughs> painted the water bottle, put the wings on it, and, and she says, now it's complete. She was thinking in systems. And it's those kind of experiences where kids get to go out in a garden, in an area around the school and discover things and make things whole again. That's part of the beauty, in my view, of what we're doing. So that's uh, my last story, <laughs> OK? Anyway, so now <laughs> we're open for conversation, questions, anything else? Um, I, it's not your last story, because get ready, Jim. <laughs> so I always think that things come together for us when we need them. And in the beginning, before you all joined us, uh, Jim was telling a story about the Catherine, let me make sure I get this right, the Ca I have a Catherine Fergus School in Detroit. Yes. And you were talking about these young women that uh, you guided to build, um, to build gardens, take care of you know, animals and, and how that connected them to earth. Then you t told us this story about bees. Now, even before you joined us, Jim, we were having a conversation with a family because we have bees in the lot and we have in our in our play yard and this happens every now and then where someone has been stung by a yellow jacket earlier in the summer and then therefore all bees become quite yeah. scary so here i am i have found this answer of having this connection of actually you walk towards the bee you're not walking away from it and i really enjoyed this now so i do have a question about um if you ha were working with us and you said and we only have this very tiny lot and i was yeah. envisioning possibly and i i don't even know if we'll be allowed to do this but i'm going to go towards it is that if i could devote let's say a three by five foot space of our parking lot to convert it over with like a raised bed what would be uh -huh. like your top three plants or maybe four plants that could, would connect children uh, to the idea of, 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 of study? And like not just study, but also of partaking. So growing and then possibly eating it. So I, yeah. I'll go back to me. Well, you know, that's not an easy question, partly because I tend not to try to answer things by what is the best, what is the least. It's still kind of hierarchical. Uh, I, I recognize the need that you're, that you're expressing, but I tend to shy away from that kind of thinking. It's still Newtonian, this idea of hierarchy and what's the best, you know, what's the worst, you know, what's the top five, what's whatever. For me, it's more important to think in, in, in systems and you can put systems in place, I think maybe this is your question as well, and you can do it incrementally, okay? Now, I would say this, and the image here shows that, I've been doing a lot of work in the last, oh, 15 years or so around pollinators uh, with a special focus around, the, uh, around butterflies, and in particular, the, the monarch butterfly. Uh, on our farm, we've got 12 acres that's dedicated as a pollinator habitat uh, resource. Uh, and I was just, yesterday my son came over, <laughs> I was showing him, I have a, a big jar uh, where I've collected uh, monarch caterpillars and they've turned into their crystal stage. And of course, I'll release them come spring. But for me, I think that because of the, uh, of the I mean, the monarchs have such an amazing story. <laughs> Unlike many other, pollinators, an amazing story of coming from, you know, the northern Mexico, flying to California, flying to Canada, and then returning every maybe fourth generation, a 3,000 mile journey uh, is an incredible story that kids can relate to almost anywhere within this region. Uh, so 
when, when you do that, it means you would, of course, have to plant uh, some varieties of milkweed because a milkweed plant is the only plant that monarchs lay eggs on. But they, they need plants not just to lay eggs on, <laughs> they need plants also to access pollen and nectar. So then you want to plant other flowering plants uh, along with, say, the milkweed. And, it can, and, and it's important with pollinators, you know, we need to have things flowering from spring to early fall because kids, uh, they're like us. They like to eat all year long, okay? <laughs> Not just in the summertime. So that means you want to have plants that are spring, that have spring blossoms, uh, that have early summer, middle summer, late summer, early fall. Uh, I saw a monarch at my garden just yesterday, okay? So that means you want to select some plants that can span the, the, the eating cycle, uh, say the monarch or with uh, other pollinators. But, but then you're able to do a lot of uh, really wonderful and fun kind of um, kids connection, okay, with, with butterflies and, and, and as well as a monarch. Uh, there's a whole effort that you all know uh, nationally to help create more habitat. You can get free milkweed uh, plants from different, uh, so, uh, different universities. Um, so it could be for the kids, they're part of a national effort now to create more habitat, to do tagging. You can do tagging of, mo of monarchs, uh, to track them. Uh, you can collect uh, the chrysalis and, and uh, see them hatch. I mean, when I came home this past spring, I think it was in April, had a jar, and I saw a, you know, a butterfly in there, ready to get out. <laughs> okay, okay, babies, you all can go. And I collected swallowtail butterflies as well. Uh, anyway, so um, that for me, again, I have a certain, maybe not a bias, but I have a certain effort going on the last 12 years or so around pollinators in general, but also butterflies uh, more specifically. Uh, the, the, one of the things that I highlighted on my own notes here is that um, that the nature tells us secrets and we have to be ready to listen. And I realized that when I do this hierarchical, uh, hierarchical thinking, that it is because I have myself have become further and further removed from the agrarian and the far. So when I listen to you, this is the thing and children, I hope you're listening too, is that you when you go into nature, you have to be ready to listen. And that means to listen to everything that it's saying. And so this idea of viewing things through systems and interconnectedness is, uh, is a really important part of the story. Whereas we in the, like, you know, growing up in different cities and stuff, I start becoming more and more removed for, so I'm looking for the traffic light. I'm looking for the intersection. And so, so it's just really putting on a new set of eyes and ears and, and, and I'm really grateful that I met you. I have to say, I'm really grateful that I posed these questions in the way that I did because it, you know, it, 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 it opens up my head of where oh, I could talk to you all day long about how we go out and breathe deep. But I realize now that I have to actually get closer. I have to get, I have to go back to assist, you know, go back to what um, my family uh, like did, you know, yes. with the, I know victory gardens from my family history yes. and it's yes. like yes. that, that you kind of lose that thread. That's true. And, um, and, and anyway, so I think it's just really great important. remembering. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I, call it, I call it a great remembering. Yeah. You know, and Einstein said, exactly. one of his quotes is that we can't solve today's problems with the way of thinking that created the problems. So we spend, you know, our, our lives K through 12, we go to college, get degrees. So, so we've been conditioned 16 to 20 years of schooling to think in a Newtonian, Cartesian kind of a way. So part of our work is that we have to go back and unlearn some things, okay, that get in the way, that get in the way, unlearn some things, but also we have to intentionally then think, well, how, how do you learn systems thinking? How do you apply it? And as I was just pointing out, sometimes how we ask the questions actually pretty much perpetuates 
and continue the problems that we're contending with by virtue of how we ask the question. So we have to even, you know, sometimes our words get in the way. Uh, if you go to some cultures, uh, you know, they have uh, maybe, mm -hmm. we have four words for seasons, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall. They have in some cultures 30 different concepts because they appreciate, you know, like early fall isn't like late fall, okay? So they have a much more broader and elaborate understanding, you know, uh, even with trees. You know, we, 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 we tell kids, okay, well, those out there, those things are trees and they are, but each tree has its own specific environment way it grows, how the bark looks, how the roots are laid out, which insects come to it, does it, does it produce fruit or flower or, 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 you know, so it has its own specificity. So, but there's no, there's no wisdom in the words, those are trees, but there is wisdom in knowing that this is a pin oak or this is a sugar maple or, or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And kids are, are being taught some of the specificity about what these trees are. I do nature walks, uh, you know, in the city, and we with, with kids and adults, we walk through the neighborhoods and we identify uh, things growing, you know, whether it's plantain or chicory growing on, along the walkways of the rest of the trees and whatever, because people walk these these streets and and have no idea yeah. of what these things are. So part of our work is wherever we are. We've got to find ways to connect people. Yeah. And then, so we have a question for you. Yes. Um, I'm going to read the whole thing. So okay. it's, um, thanks so much for this point about habits of thought. I thank you too. So I am also thinking of how our bodies carry these habits. What can we do with our bodies, especially with our kids, in order to unlock new habits of perception? Okay. I think that, 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 that one thing is the, uh, that I hear people all the time say, well, Jim, you're preaching, you're promoting systems thought of connecting all these different, for us, it seems like separate entities because that's how we're taught. Well, I say, well, but what's important is for us to spend time, whether it's in meditation, prayer, stillness, to connect with the innate wisdom. So while we're on this, uh, this, this virtual call, and speaking and whatever else, we never said lungs breathe, heart beat, kidneys do your work, liver do your work, stomach, adrenal gland, and on and on. We never said to those organs and functions, do your work. They're all being done innately with a kind of a, a unconscious wisdom. So what it means is, that the essential functions of life are being handled not by our conscious mind. Okay? Only there are essential. <laughs> so divine wisdom knew these, these, these human folk, we can't leave just these really essential things up to their conscious mind. Okay. So so part of our work is to try to understand certain whether they were ancient rituals or whether they are current rituals that connect us with an inward look, an introspection, okay? Um, some people, they call it prayer, meditation. Uh, if you go to martial arts, it's mostly about that, that inner strength, that introspection. So I would say, just think about and, and become involved in these different kinds of modalities of introspection. Uh, oftentimes take around with me um, like different uh, things, rocks, uh, pieces of wood, feathers, shells, Tibetan singing bowl. For certain people, they use different kinds of sounds to help them with an introspection of feeling the vibrations. So I would begin with, with the thought that within our bodies, there's a wisdom, there's an innate wisdom that can help guide then our external manifestations. That's like one thing, or, or, or 
a one thought. And I would also, you know, when I'm speaking, I oftentimes bring with me, um, you know, um, a bunch of rocks. And I will ask people uh, if they feel with these rocks a close connection. And usually people don't even raise their hand because they look at these, at these rocks and say, well, no, there's no connection. Or they might say, well, you know, uh, I, I'm a, my mom was a geologist. I've been you know, collecting rocks for many years. I have a whole great collection. They might say, uh, you know, we do uh, uh, rock climbing uh, in the mountain area. I love, I, love, I love rock climbing, which are all great answers. Then I ask the people what makes blood red. These are say oxygen. We'll finally get to iron in the hemoglobin chain. And I ask them why are our bones so hard? They'll say calcium. I said plus 23 other trace minerals. Okay. So I think that by thinking about things differently, that people again would regard a rock as having no connection to rocks. So in my view, there are things like that that can help us individually form a different connection with what's around us. Quantum science says we're all from the same source. It says we're all interrelated. So we have to find ways in our daily practice, in our daily lives, to remember that and connect with that, which might mean that you might have an altar, you might have a table, uh, as I have, you know, a, a, a table, an altar, and on there are all kinds of stuff. I've got feathers, I've got different kinds of shells, I've got different kinds of rocks, I've got various kinds of, of, of pieces of wood and, 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 and whatever else. <laughs> that's on there and that vibration in my house is vibrating and it's speaking to me. And I said, yes, we're here, we're all family. And um, again, how we speak, uh, you know, again, indigenous people, when you, when, you, when you talk to them about what we call corn, if you go out Southwest, they don't just call corn, corn, they call it their grandmother, okay? If you go up North, uh, where well, the folk up there harvest wild rice. They call it their grandmother because it's part of their family. So for me then, it's, it's incorporating words, rituals like that, that can help us with this great remembering and that can help us throw off some of those kinds of cloaks of the kind of Newtonian Cartesian view of the world. Those are a few thoughts. That is lovely, thank you. You know, I've, I've, I have, again, I have, I have had, you know, with trees and plants and whatever, some, I've had women who have, have come out of Rwanda, uh, who, who have escaped, you know, the wars in Rwanda, who made their way to, to, um, to uh, Lexington. We get them into a garden and they begin to cry, okay, because their feet are in the soil. Anyway, I could, other questions? Do we have other questions? I had that's the question that's in the um it's in the chat. Does anybody want to shout out? They feel more comfortable talking. It's there. Those yeah, are welcome yeah. to you. You know, and, and, and what you all are doing, uh, I, I saw on your website, you've got a variety of books. You know, keep reading like that again. This um, movie called Dirt the Movie. Keep watching videos. Uh, keep reading books um, uh, that helps us unpack. See, we're, 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 we're taught to think homocentrically, okay? That it's all human-centered and what's over there doesn't matter. So we've got to find ways to unpack that kind of worldview and it's done in a whole variety of ways. And what you all are doing with the young people is so very important that one of the most beautiful ways and important ways to unpack some of this stuff is to literally get outside, touch things, smell things, learn how things grow, learn about the network. You know, there's a great movie called Fungi, uh, or it's, it's called something else, Fungi, I, I forget. Anyway, that's a, <laughs> it's a great movie uh, uh, about uh, the role evolutionary and the role now of fungi, which is the fungi are, are, are like the internet. Uh, there's this marvelous network, okay, 
highway, if you will, underground that, that, that goes all over Turtle Island, okay? Um, so I think that, that those kinds of, of, of other elements can help us unpack and can help us then have these breakthroughs, uh, say individually, uh, to, to get out of these, these trappings uh, that we've been caught up in for the last 500 years. Thank you. And then I, because we, we discovered slime mold a couple of weeks ago. Yes. And it, we, yes. Yes. I, and uh, when we were out in the woods, and it's a small little yeah. patch of woods, uh -huh. but it was so amazing to see that slime, how it, it, we saw it in every state of its movement, and it just oh, wow. moved, wow. it moving <laughs> down the logs. It's so neat. And um, so I was wondering, too, like what your place of um, being, you know, this, this, again, this being ready to listen is like you know i didn't know what slime mold you know i didn't know right. that i didn't right. Right. i didn't know anything and then to, and each time we discover something is an opportunity to uh to research it and to like figure out what it's connected and you know i've, I've learned i've learned so much about what's growing under our ground that connects yeah. us yeah. uh that are from flowers like their root systems reach for like yes. you only see the flower yes and now I'm it's totally, is it totally, or it, I, anyway, you only see the flower, the plant, but the root system mm -hmm. reaches right. out far and wide. So it's like that kind of thing, it just changes my, it changes my thinking. And it's like, mainly because I realized how much I don't know right. and how right. much right. joy is in the pursuit of finding things out. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I mentioned early on the idea of indigenous wisdom and culture. And indigenous people, again, <clears throat> make this point here, that when it comes to the earth, everyone is indigenous, okay? Everyone is indigenous to the earth. Also, everyone, if you look back in our history of our culture, everyone can be traced back to an indigenous people. So part of our work, is this great remembering from whence we've come, okay, culturally, but it's, but it's also an embracing of where we are now. So then part of our work of this kind of like this work around unpacking and rethinking and, re, and remembering is to be much more intentional about reading about, meeting, connecting with people who are indigenous because their wisdom, their culture was based upon this sense of all my relations, that we're all related, we're all, they would name themselves, as you may, may well know, they would name their clan, the bear clan, the clan of, of the salmon people, you know, the people of the mountains, uh, the people of, of Columbia River or, or, or whatever, is how would, they would name themselves as a clan and at times also name themselves in terms of, of their own personal name, okay? Think about, well, Red Cloud, okay? Uh, so and what we do, so we go around, you might, we go around and we have these, we, we, we build buildings, okay? And what we do typically, we name the building after some human being that gave money to build the building. But you can't quantify the earth's natural resources that went into building the building. It took the earth millions, maybe a billion years to make limestone rock, quarry rock, uh, you know, quartz and, 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 and whatever else, or make oil, okay, or, or, or make sand. So in my view, <laughs> we should go through and rename, okay, all these structures and name them after something from nature, okay? Uh, that, really, that, that truly symbolizes the, 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 the greater, uh, and you can't put a financial, but you know, the greater contribution to that building wasn't this individual who gave some money, okay? How do you quantify a million years, two million years of creating this limestone mountain? Okay, so it's things like that that we need to be rethinking on a wide, on a wide level. Okay, uh, creating you know 
um, have the kids, you know, think of names they might call themselves based upon something from the outside or from nature, just things like that. Yeah, I, I could see that that's a whole um, pursuit that all our families that are having their elementary school kids and their high school kids home now with the virtual school, that it's like if you, if one of your assignments was to go down to uh, Washington, D.C. and check out all the buildings down there, which do definitely have people yes. and, and business uh, uh, government agencies names on them and think about all the different materials yes. that they are clad in just the cladding yes. it would be that or where those things came from where the cladding came from like what what part of the country that they you know dug right. up and dragged these from right. that would be an amazing pursuit yeah and that right. you could learn so much and connect it connect us yeah. oh anyway yeah. i i'm sorry jim because i i could listen to you all day <laughs> and i'm just sitting here looking at it's 1105 and i know that you have a lot going on so and other people do too you know we're all oh yeah oh yeah like, oh. like i said i i could talk to you for the next three years but anyway so um have another but, you wanna, thank you and yeah and, sure yeah and so we'll close off. And if anyone wants to stay, we'll say big thank you, everybody. Thank Great you all. Fun. Thank you all for allowing me to be here with you all. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much, Jim. And um, if anyone has any questions, I think we can go ahead and, and sign off now, Josh, I think. Um, uh, and then we'll be good. And then, Jim, I want to just really thank you for um, for being with us today. My blessing. A lovely day. Thank yeah. you all. Tell, tell your fish hello for us. We will. We will. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank yes. you. Bye, so dear hearts. Bye-bye. Bye. I know.